Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for being here and uh, thank you to James and Kerry for these wonderful talks. Um, this talk will be uh, hopefully a nice compliment because uh, I'm going to talk about a specific application of structural realism. Uh, so specifically the project I'm talking about arose because uh, I read a lot of quantum foundations papers which proceed by putting quantum mechanics in a wider space of possible theories and then studying the relationships between the theories in that space. And this sort of work is usually advertised as giving us some sort of intuition or understanding of quantum mechanics. Um, and in fact, I do share the intuition that we are gaining some sort of insight from this, the, this research. Uh, but I think it's not uh, straightforwardly obvious what precisely we learn from studying relationships between counterfactual theories. Um, so I think some sort of account of the, the nature of this research is required. Um, and there do exist some uh, existing discussions of the, the significance of this research, but they tend to have a, a quite a re, an instrumentalist or anti-realist flavor. So for example, people have suggested that we should think of them as telling us that quantum mechanics is really about information or about language. Um, and so I being somewhat more, more inclined towards realism, I set out to understand how it, would, how it would be appropriate to understand the sort of research uh, if you are a realist. So as you will have inferred from the title, I'm going to argue that uh, this sort of research should be understood as a form. I'm sorry, Emily, can you hear me? It sounds like maybe we lost your audio connection. Emily, can you hear us? Right, so uh, I will present just my interpretation of uh, my structural interpretation of this research framework. Um, I will discuss some interpretational issues that may arise along the way. And finally, at this time, I'll make some comments on the future of research in this framework. Uh, so first off, generalized probabilistic theories belong to a, a family of related research programs within quantum foundations, which also include uh, things like device independent approaches, uh, operational theories, uh, non-signaling boxes and so on. Um, and all of these frameworks have quite a lot in common. Uh, so, and most of what I say will apply to all of them, but for the sake of specificity, I will henceforth focus on GPTs. So a GPT is a quadruple consisting of a set of preparations, a set of measurements, a set of transformations, and a probability function giving the relationship, the probabilistic relationships uh, between uh, measurement outcomes conditional on uh, previous choices of preparation, transformation, and measurement. So because this framework is very general and doesn't make reference to any theoretical entities or background theoretical assumptions, a very wide range of possible theories can be expressed this way. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can study the relationships between different possible theories. Uh, in particular, a lot of research in this framework takes the particular form of proving a result like every GPT with the property A must also have the property B. So for example, Toner has a lovely result proving that uh, every, every generalized probabilistic theory which is non-signaling must obey a monogamy bound on the strength of multipartite non-local correlations. Uh, it's also very common to use frameworks like these to write new axiomatizations of quantum mechanics. So essentially what we do there is we uh, provide a set of possible features which a GPT might have, and we demonstrate that uh, the only GPT which has all of these features uh, is the GPT formalization of quantum mechanics, which I'll refer to as QM. So a classic of the genre is uh, Hardy's quantum theory from five reasonable axioms, um, and a more recent uh, approach is the existence of an, of an information unit as a postulate of quantum theory by Masanis, Muller, Adhisiak, and Perez-Gassia. So as I said, 
Uh, existing approaches to interpreting this research uh, tends to be uh, very uh, anti-realist or ins instrumentalist in flavor. Um, and this isn't a coincidence because there are a number of ob obvious obstacles to uh, thinking about th this research in a realist way. So first off, there's the fact that uh, this, this framework has been explicitly designed to force us to speak in entirely operational terms. Um, and as Grinbaum points out, it basically eliminates any notion of theoretical entity, system, object from, from our physics. Uh, so that might look, might look quite worrying for the traditional realist because scientific realism has often been parsed as realism about theoretical entities. Uh, so the obvious move for the realist is to move to a form of realism, which likewise does away with theoretical entities, uh, which is to say structural realism, and that, of course, is the approach I will take here. The second problem is that uh, the re results in this framework are largely concerned with facts about counterfactual theories. So we're, we're describing the relationships between a whole bunch of theories which are not real. Um, and one might quite reasonably ask what could possibly be realist about results which tell us things about theories that we know not to be real. Um, However, it's been well observed that uh, one promising route for structural realists to avoid, avoid the Newman problem is to postulate relations which involve, uh, is to postulate structures involving intentional relations. Um, and as, as we've seen from James's talk, talk uh, it's common to use intentional relations that are modal in character. Um, and of course, modal relations are often analyzed by philosophers in terms of a space of possible worlds, uh, where we uh, postulate the space possible worlds and then study relationships between them. So there's an obvious analogy to be made here between the space of possible worlds and the space of possible theories studied in the GPT framework. Uh, so I'm going to argue that this, that um, results in the GPT framework concerning the relations between possible possible theories uh, can be interpreted as a, as a way of studying modal relations. And that allows us to argue that rather than being uh, results about counterfactual theories, the results in this framework are instead should instead be regarded as uh, studying real modal relations. Um, the final obstacle is that if we're going to regard uh, these axiomatizations as representing real structure, it looks like we have a pretty severe problem of underdetermination since we have a number of different possible axiomatizations. Um, and that might worry the realist because many realists, particularly selective realists, feel that underdetermination is a major threat to realism. Um, and so I'm delighted that James has argued that structural realism need not be a form of, of selective realism, because I am going to argue that what we have here is precisely an implementation of structural realism, which is not a selective, a selective realism. So in light of the success of the axiomatization program, um, and given the continuing difficulty of providing an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which everyone finds acceptable, uh, a number of people in the field have suggested that we should stop trying to interpret uh, quantum mechanics um, and, and instead move to axiomatizing it, since an axiomatization offers us a way to understand why quantum mechanics is the way it is. So there are a couple of points to make here. The first is that interpreting quantum mechanics is not just about uh, gaining an, a subjective feeling of understanding. Uh, interpretation is also intended as a way of rectifying some inadequacies in the theory. So in particular, the fact that the theory doesn't deliver us a precise prescription for when we should switch from unitary evolution to non-unitary collapse, which leads to inconsistencies in situations like the frau renner paradox. Um, now, uh, axiomatiz axiomatizations of quantum mechanics can't really help with that particular problem because most of them take measurement as an analyzed primitive, and therefore they don't really tell us anything about under what physical circumstances we should suppose a measurement takes place. Uh, I can envision an approach where one would sort of take uh, measurement to be defined functionally uh, by the axioms, and if then if the axioms were sufficiently detailed, one might then be able to apply them to draw some conclusions about the frau renner case and other cases like it. Uh, but as far as I know, no one has yet gone down that route. And so, uh, at least for the moment, I think there is still a need for interpretation. Um, uh, but however, I want to now put the measurement problem aside uh, and meet the uh, axiomatization program on its own terms, so to speak. So I will henceforth suppose that we do have perfectly well-defined categories of preparations, trans transformations and measurements, and that there's never any problem about how to apply those terms. Um, and I'm going to argue that even under that condition, uh, the ax axiomatization program is actually still in need of some interpretation. Uh, so the reason, reason for that is that the structure of an axiomatization is basically as follows. We set out um, 
at our collection of axioms and each of those axioms singles out a set of GPTs. Uh, and we then simply have to prove that the only GPT which lies in the intersection of all of those sets is QM. Uh, so the obvious problem is that given that the space of GPTs is continuous, there's going to be an infinite number of possible ways of doing that. You know, trivially, I can always just select two random GPTs, A and B, and say that my first axiom is the set AQM and my second axiom is the set BQM. Uh, clearly that axiomatization does single out quantum mechanics uniquely, but if I were to write a paper on it, nobody would find that very interesting or informative. So this shows that uh, the mere existence of an axiomatization doesn't tell us anything very interesting. It's only certain sorts of axiomatizations which are regarded as, as being uh, informative. So various people have had things to say about what sorts of axioms are interesting. So Ravelli uh, tells us that they must have clear physical content and be experimentally true. Um, similarly, Grinbaum says to us that they must be simple, physical, and they must be easy to understand. So the problem here is that it's not clear to me that any of these uh, comments necessarily rule out axioms like AQM. Uh, insofar as we know that QM holds in the real world, we know that that's experimentally true. Uh, it certainly says something physical. It seems relatively clear. And from a, a certain point of view, it's simple and easy to understand. Um, now, of course, Ravelli and Grimbaum presumably mean something else when they use the term sim simple. Uh, but I think what, what, what is meant does need to be cashed out. So it seems to me that what's really going on here is that these sorts of comments are appealing uh, implicitly to our intuitions about fundamentality. Uh, so for example, we're willing to accept that something like the existence of a unit of information might be a fundamental fact about reality. Uh, and that fact might expl explain or partly explain why quantum mechanics is the way it is. But we're not really willing to accept membership in the set AQM as a fundamental fact of reality. And in that case, we tend to think the explanatory relation goes in the other direction. We think that the fact that the world obeys quantum mechanics explains its membership in the set AQM. So what this, uh, what this really seems to show is that when we make our assessments of, of when an axiomatization is good, we're not really, really appealing just to purely formal properties of the axioms. We're also um, making an assessment based on our background picture of what the contents of reality are and, and some account of what the axioms are meant to represent within that picture. So I think there are a number of possible ways of giving uh, this account of what axioms are meant to do. The first is the purely practical, practical rationale, which says we like simple axiomatizations because simple theories are easier to do calculations with. Um, and that's perfectly reasonable, but I don't think that's what's going on here, um, partly because it wouldn't explain all this talk of intuition and, and understanding, um, and partly because, as far as I'm aware, nobody is proposing to actually do calculations with an operational axiomatization of quantum mechanics, and nor would those calculations be likely to be easier in most cases. So a second possibility is to adopt a Humean approach and say, well, the laws of nature are the axioms are defined by the, the best systematization of everything that actually takes place um, in the whole of the universe. Uh, so then we can, we can say that when someone writes down an axiomatization of quantum mechanics, what they're attempting to do is find a better systematization of our existing data in the hope that that systematization will be, then be closer to the real underlying laws of nature as defined by the best system. Um, and I think that account is in many ways quite neat and satisfying, and it's actually a good counterexample to the claim sometimes made that the best systems account doesn't really describe what scientists, scientists do, because here we have what looks very much like a group of scientists who are specifically trying to find a best system. However, I am also not a human for various reasons. Uh, the most relevant here, I think, is that uh, in a human universe with no necessary connections, there's no particular reason to suppose that the very limited uh, subset, subset of the universe that we have observed uh, is a representative sample of the rest of the universe. And so there's no reason to think that the best systematization of our very limited data is going to be either predictive or reflective of the real best system as defined on the whole of the universe. So it looks a bit hard to understand what the point of finding the best system would be in this account. Um, a Humean will typically respond to this by saying that, uh, that they're no worse off than realists because realists must uh, are likewise subject to the problem of induction and must likewise suppose without proof that regularities will, will persist. And that's true. Uh, but I think the realist assumption is much less ad hoc and it coheres much better with the realist picture of reality than the Humean version. Um, 
But in any case, uh, I know I'm not going to convince any humans in the audience within the next three minutes. So I will simply observe that I did set out to find a realist interpretation of this framework. And I don't think the human, the human approach is really uh, giving a, a robustly realist picture here. So finally, the realist uh, way to do this, which is to suppose that when we propose an axiomatization, we're, we're putting forward a hypothesis about the real structure of the world in some sense. Um, and then our preferences for different for certain sorts of axiomatizations can be explained in the usual way um, as, as basically the process of hypothesis selection and the criteria that we apply are, are meant to be simply the same criteria that we apply in more ordinary sort of sorts of cases when we make, make selections of hypotheses. So let's now now consider what what sort of structure these axiomatizations might be understood to study. Uh, so a little bit of terminology. Uh, I'm going to use the term Humean mosaic in the, in the normal way to refer to the collection of all uh, the local matters of particular physical facts within a possible world. Um, so because a GPT is defined uh, using entirely operational language, we, we can we may sometimes be able to to define a GPT uh, which describes the events in a given Humean mosaic. Uh, now that's not guaranteed. Uh, there's certain the, the, the mosaic must have at least certain sorts of structure to make that possible. So, for example, it must be possible to identify uh, repeated instances of the same preparation, measurement and transformation across space time. Um, and if we want the GPT to be unique, then there will have to be fairly robust probabilistic relations between uh, the, the uh, outcomes of measurements, preparations, and transformations. Um, so let's identify a set of special human mosaics, which I'll call the GPT mosaics. And so those are the mosaics for which there exists a unique GPT, which predicts the probabilistic relationships uh, between preparations, measurements, and transformations on this mosaic with a combination of simplicity, strength, and fit, which is robustly better than any alternative. So I'm using robustly in the same sense as Lewis there uh, to, to mean that uh, the GPT should be better than its alternatives by any reasonable standard of simplicity. Uh, so the point of this definition is that to a GPT mosaic, we can always associate a unique GPT. Um, moreover, given a GPT, clearly we can always construct at least one uh, GPT mosaic for which it is the associated GPT. That means that given a set of GPTs, we can map that set backwards to a set of GPT mosaics and thus to a set of possible worlds that contain, the mosa that contain those mosaics. So if you recall, um, I explained that a great deal of research in this framework is based on the relation uh, every GPT which has feature A also has feature B. Using this language, we can rewrite that uh, relation as saying every possible world which contains a GPT mosaic uh, associated to a GPT having feature A is also a possible world which contains a GPT mosaic uh, associated to a GPT having property B. And that should sound fairly familiar because, of course, um, in the possible world semantics, the modal logic, uh, metaphysical necessitation is often analyzed such that A metaphysically necessitates B, uh, if and only if, every possible world in which it is true that A is also a possible world in which it is true that, that, that B. So this relation, which is ubiquitous in the GPT framework, can really be understood as expressing metaphysical necessitation uh, relative to our being in a uh, GPT mosaic. Uh, furthermore, because axiomatizations are also built on this relation, uh, axiomatizations of quantum mechanics can also be understood as expressing metaphysical necessitation. That is, we provide a set of properties and we then, we then show that these properties are sufficient to metaphysically necessitate quantum mechanics. So we don't have to think of these axiomatizations uh, as, as telling us things about counterfactual theories. We can think about them uh, as telling us something about the real modal structure of the world. Now, nothing I've said so far helps us very much with the problem of selecting good axiomatizations because um, this analysis in terms of metaphysical necessitation applies to any, any uh, axiomatization at all, even the trivial AB axiomatization. So I suggest that what we need to add here is the supposition that, that although any axiomatization is sufficient to, to necessitate quantum mechanics, uh, there's some particular axiomatization which is uh, responsible for quantum, the way quantum mechanics is in the actual world. And I'm going to suggest doing, doing that by appeal to the concept of laws of nature. So obviously, from what I've already said, I'm not a human, so I'm not going to do this, going to uh, talk about laws of nature um, in, a, in, terms, in terms of best systems. 
Uh, instead, I'm going to suggest uh, talking about laws of nature uh, within a realist paradigm where we have governing laws. Uh, that said, I'm going to be a bit anti-reductionist here, so I'm not going to provide an analysis of what specifically laws are or how they govern. Instead, I'm going to suggest uh, talking about uh, referring to laws by describing their effects. So one very general way to way to uh, to describe the effect of a law is to associate it with with a set of mosaics. So a law is mapped to the set of mosaics in which the law is true, uh, and I will refer to those sets as constraints. We can then simply say that a law governs uh, by by means of requiring that the actual mosaic uh, must lie within the associated constraint. The point of this is that even though we may not know what laws are, when we want to reason about them, we can use the, uh, these constraints uh, as proxies for them. So I will, will refer to the set of constraints that are induced by the actual laws of nature as the LON. Um, and we can then straightforwardly say that uh, cl clearly by definition, the actual mosaic must lie in the intersection of all the LON constraints. So let's now suppose that um, as the GPT framework suggests, suggests we are indeed in a GPT mosaic. Um, and we can, if we like, we can further suppose that we're, we're in a GPT mosaic because that is necessitated by the laws of nature. So there is some uh, LON constraint which singles out the set of GPT mosaics as its associated constraint. So we know that we are in a, GP, we're, we're in a mosaic which lies in the set of GPT mosaics. And we also know that we're in a mosaic which lies in the intersection of all the LON constraints. It follows that each of the LON constraints must have some support on the set of GPT mosaics. Uh, so, to each LON constraint, we can then associate a um, we can then associate a GPT constraint consisting of the support of, of that constraint on the set of GPT mosaics. And of course, we've already seen that given a set of GPT mosaics, we can map that to a set of GPTs. So each law of law of each law of nature can be understood as inducing a set of GPTs, um, and clearly, if it is indeed the case that the, the actual the the uh, GPT which holds in the actual world is QM, it must be the case that QM lies in the intersection of all these sets. So that is to say, uh, the laws of nature of nature induce what is essentially an axiomatization. They induce a set of sets of GPTs such that the intersection of all these sets uh, contains contains QM. Um, one caveat there is that nothing I've said thus far implies that that this intersection must contain only QM. Um, and whether you want to demand that or not will depend to some extent on your feelings about determinism. Um, but we can certainly add that as a supposition if we like, uh, and that would lead to the conclusion that the laws of nature induce exactly an axiomatization, uh, that, a, a set of sets of GPTs that single out quantum mechanics uniquely. So the, the point, the idea, the point here is that uh, if, if, if we think of axiomatizations as being induced by the laws of nature, then when, it, when someone proposes an axiomatization, that can be understood as a proposal for what the real axiomatization induced by the laws of nature might be. Um, and that has a number of really nice, uh, nice consequences. The first is that it's very easy to explain the nature of the understanding that we supposedly get uh, from these axiomatizations. It's simply the usual kind of understanding that one gets from, uh, from learning about the reason or cause of something. Um, so of course, we don't know, necessarily know for sure that any proposed axiomatization is the correct one, but that's kind of the way that explanation works in the real world too. Uh, if something happens and then someone proposes an explanation for it, um, if you find the explanation plausible, you'll usually consider yourself to have gained some understanding, uh, even if you haven't been given um, a water, watertight proof that this is indeed the, the true, true cause of, of this event. So uh, on this picture, it, it, it makes sense that we should feel that when we uh, learn a new exploitation, we've, we've understood something new about quantum mechanics. Uh, second, it's easy to, to explain why we have preferences for certain axiomatizations over others, because if we take ourselves to be searching for the correct, the true axiomatization induced by the laws of nature, um, it makes sense that our preferences for axiomatizations would be influenced by our beliefs about what the laws of nature should look like. So, for example, many physicists believe that the laws of nature should be simple, or they should be elegant, or they, sh they should uh, feature natural kinds or something like that something like that. Um, and, and this explains why we, th why we think that axi axioms should likewise be simple or elegant or feature nat natural kinds. We, we expect them to, be, to have these properties because they're inherited from the laws of nature. 
Um, and finally, I think this way of thinking also makes it makes it easier to give, give an explanation of why we take axiomatizations to be a scientifically useful activity. Uh, because if we do uh, figure out the correct axiomatization, we may be able to make inferences backwards from that, that axiomatization to the form of the LOM constraints. Um, and knowing those constraints is like, likely to be useful when we come to do things like try to unify quantum mechanics with other theories, as in quantum gravity, or when, when we just want to apply it to new domains. Um, so I think this is a real advantage of, of the realist account over a Humean or anti-realist account, uh, in that it, it kind of explains what the point of all this is and why uh, it's a good use of our time to try and find new axiomatizations of quantum mechanics. So one concern that a realist might have at this point uh, is that if we are regarding a different axiomatization of quantum mechanics as re representing different possible ways the world could be, it looks as if we have a pretty extreme case of underdetermination here. Um, and that's a problem because uh, underdetermination is often regarded as a really bad thing for realism, um, and many realists work very hard to avoid that. Um, so, in particular, uh, structural realism is often motivated at, at the scene as a response to the pessimistic meta-induction. Um, and the way in which that argument is made in many cases seems to depend on the claim that structure, structure is not underdetermined in the same way that uh, ontology is. Um, so a structuralist might be concerned that uh, we seem to have an instance of underdetermination of structure. Uh, one approach that the structuralist could take here would be to, uh, would, would be to, um, adopt a form of, of selective realism, which essentially says uh, we'll avoid underdetermination by being very careful about the limits of our realist commitments. So in a case like this, we'll say uh, that actually all, all of these different structures should really be understood as, as manifestations of the same structure in some sense. So that, that would entail saying that every axiomatization of quantum mechanics, or at least every axiomatization which, is, which seems interesting and useful in some sense, reveals some new aspect of the modal structure of the world to us, but there's no one correct axiomatization. Um, the problem with that route here, in my view, is that if there's no uh, correct axiomatization, then there's also no route to, to infer backwards from an axiomatization to any to uh, the laws of nature or to any broader constraints. And so this this picture of axiomatization seems to make it look much look much less scientifically useful. Um, and this would is sort of my general complaint against selective realism in in many contexts that. If you're really concerned to avoid underdetermination uh, by limiting your realist beliefs, kind of the, the inevitable consequence of that is that you can't have very robust realist beliefs. And that's kind of a pity because uh, it's often specifically having robust realist beliefs and taking different possibilities seriously as alternative ways the world could be, which leads to scientific progress. Um, so I think that at least for someone who's interested in realism as a route to doing better science, uh, selective realism is not actually the right way to go. So I think that, that although that uh, what we've got here should be regarded as a case of structural realism, but not selective realism, where we should take it that, uh, where we should adopt a kind of broad epistemic opt optimism saying that uh, we do believe there's some real modal structure out there and we do believe that uh, each of the axiomatization stations we put out could possibly be correct, but we may never know which one is correct, and we don't take this under determination to necessarily undermine uh, the, the, the realism that we have here. Um, a related concern you might have here uh, is that uh, you might ask, okay, if we are going to be realists, why should we be realists about the constraints rather than about the GPTs? Because after all, it, it kind of seems as, as if GPTs aren't underdetermined in, in the same way as structure. So if we dislike underdetermination, maybe we should just be GPT realists. Um, so for the reasons I've just discussed, uh, being a GPT realist seems less likely to lead, to lead to progress because there's no obvious route to infer backwards from a GPT to any broader conclusions about the world. Um, but also, I think GPT realism is less explanatorial, explanatorily powerful than constraint realism. Um, and that's because a GPT is, is defined by giving a separate, a dis different probability distribution for every possible prepared transform measure scenario that the theory allows. Um, and so, in principle, each of those distributions is entirely independent from the other others, which means that uh, if you are a realist only about the GPTs, you shouldn't uh, really expect to be able to, to make inferences about the results of prepare measure trans prepare, prepare transform measure scenarios that you haven't yet tried from the results of the one, of ones that you have tried. 
But of course, that's not how things really work. Uh, in quantum mechanics, for example, we take it that a theory gives us a precise prediction for every possible uh, prepare transform measure scenario uh, allowed by the theory. But given that the theory allows for continuous parametrizations, clearly we can't have actually actually checked each one of those. Um, so, so GPT realism would, would suggest that we shouldn't make we shouldn't believe that, and we should uh, suppose that we know nothing about the the, the, the scenarios we haven't yet investigated. So in order to explain why we take it, why we, why, in order to explain the, the functional relationship between different possible prepared measure transforms, uh, prepared, uh, prepared transform measure scenarios, um, it seems you, you do have to, have to impose some kind of constraint. You have to impose at least a continuity constraint or consistency or something which will uh, justify your claim to know about the results of scenarios you haven't yet tried. Um, so for that reason, uh, although uh, GPT realism and constraint realism are in a minimal sense uh, empirically equivalent in that they, they both lead us to QM, um, uh, constraint realism is a much better explanation because it allows us to regard, to make sense of the, the functional relationships between different uh, scenarios rather than having to just assume that they're all independent and any relationships are, are entirely uh, coincidental. Okay, so I now want to make some comments about principle theories because an axiomatization of quantum mechanics looks a lot like a principle theory. Uh, and indeed, many people working in this field have, uh, have suggested that, that one of their motivations for writing an axiomatization uh, is to provide a principle theory formulation of quantum mechanics. So the term principle theory, of course, comes from Einstein, who made this distinction between constructive theories, which are supposed to uh, give a detailed microscopic account of everything that's going on, um, at, at a fundamental level, and principle theories, which uh, use broad, empirically well-confirmed generalizations to derive uh, some interesting consequences. Um, and the key point to make here is that Einstein tended to think of, uh, of, of constructive theories as being better than principle theories. Uh, so he kind of thought that we should, we should just, we should mostly be aiming for constructive theories, and we should just uh, postulate principle theories in the cases where um, we have not yet been able to come up with a constructive theory, but we still want to make some sort of progress. Um, and as uh, Grinbaum, I think, observes, that doesn't really seem to, to be what's going on here, because qu qu standard quantum mechanics is already a constructive theory. So by Einstein's reasoning, we would have no reason to come up with all these principle theories versions of it. We'd be going in the wrong direction. Um, Moreover, these axiomatizations of quantum mechanics don't make any new predictions that standard quantum mechanics doesn't already make. Uh, so again, it seems as if we're not, these, these, these uh, principle theories are not being used in the way that Einstein envisioned to make new predictions. They're, they, they're clearly doing something else. Um, so I think that although it's fair to say that uh, these axiomatizations are principle theories, if we're going to say that, we do need, need a different account of what, what a principle theory is and what the principles in it are supposed to represent. And I think that uh, regarding them as a form of, of structural realism is a really nice way to uh, provide that account. We can kind of, we, we now have a picture where the standard constructive theory approach can be regarded as, as a form of standard realism where, where we have theoretical entities um, and microscopic mechanisms and so on. And then the uh, principle theory approach can be regarded as a form of structural realism, which makes uh, the same predictions uh, and is still realist in its intention, but it eliminates some of the extra ontological baggage attached to the constructive theory approach. Okay, so finally, I wanted to make some comments about the future of uh, generalized probabilistic theories, because uh, if we take it that this is, is an interesting form of structural realism, and if we take it that this is a, a, a direction in which science is moving and taking to, and taking more seriously, then naturally we might want to think about ways to extend this to other regimes or uh, and to, to generalize the framework more more to be used in more uh, various different ways. Uh, so there exists a variety of operational formulations of general relativity. Uh, so. But there's uh, versions of that by Ellers, Pirani, Shield, uh, De Felicia and Bini, and Hardy. Um, and Hardy also has a operational formula an operational formulation of quantum field theory. Um, and he even has some comments to make about operational formulations of quantum gravity. Although, um, given that quantum gravity is still in fairly early stages of development and doesn't make a lot of uh, concrete predictions, it's, it's pretty hard to operationalize it at this stage. Um, but nonetheless, there's, a, there's, there's clearly this area of development uh, where this, this operational structural approach is being applied uh, to physics much more widely. 
Um, in, an, in another direction, uh, you might be worried about this framework because although it is fairly general, it still does make certain assumptions about the, the nature and structure of reality. So in particular, this framework um, where we have preparations, transformations and measurements does seem to build in uh, quite a lot of assumptions about predefined causal order um, and time because uh, typically it's assumed that we will have a preparation followed by a transformation followed by a measurement uh, and that various different operations can be related to one another in a different causal order. Um, now there's various indications from modern physics that maybe we shouldn't think of causal order as being uh, deeply fundamental. So for example, we've seen uh, interest from within quantum mechanics in uh, all at once theories and retrocausal theories. Um, and also we've seen uh, in quantum gravity, various attempts to derive causal order from something deeper. Um, so if we are going to take this, this framework further, it seems likely that we might want to find ways to uh, to do this operational reasoning without necessarily a dependence on a predefined causal order. So there's some very nice work on what's called the process framework due to Arish Kopf and Cerf, um, where which basically is a generalization of the GPT framework uh, to two cases where we don't have a predefined causal order. And there's some really nice uh, results which can be uh, obtained within this, this framework. For example, uh, there's a great paper by uh, Shrapnel and Costa demonstrating that um, Context, quantum contextuality at All right, so again, I want to thank uh, Emily again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, uh, if people have questions, I know I have a few. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I just had a, a clarificatory question to start and then maybe, maybe a follow-up, but probably not. Um, so I understood that you didn't want to endorse uh, human as an overall kind of, you know, humanism, two court humanism. But was I, am I correct in thinking that you are still when it comes to the question, what are the probabilities in GPTs, you are giving a human analysis of those, or is that a misunderstanding? Uh, no, so I, I, I have avoided in this talk talking about probabilities too much because that's a whole other question. Um, I, I am personally inclined, inclined to favor a uh, kind of gnomic frequentism view where frequencies, frequencies are imposed all at once um, on the whole of uh, the universe and and the frequencies are kind of required to match or approximately match uh, the frequencies prescribed by the laws. So it is a kind of, it is a, a form of frequentism, but the frequencies are imposed externally rather than uh, read off the universe as an Athenian approach. Um, but th that is, as I say, it's a whole other complicated question. Yeah. Yeah, because well, my my follow-up was going to be um, so you talked about like whether there exists a unique GPT which robustly predicts better than other alternatives in order to define a, a GPT mosaic. And I was sort of worried about, um, you know, in order to make a connection between the raw statistics and any kind of uh, probabilities, you need to have the assumption that there's some sort of independence and uniformity uh, between like the trials. And in this case, you also kind of need that there's like a repeated preparation uh, yeah. or identical preparation. And I was worried about how to get the resources, the ontological resources to talk about a repeated uh, uh, preparation or also the resources to give an account of why we should think of these things as IID or whatever in the first place. Yeah, yeah so part of the definition of a, of a GPT mosaic is that it needs to contain at least enough structure that we can define repeated instances. Um, so for a, a general randomly generated new mosaic, that certainly wouldn't be the case. Um, so uh, the idea here is that one would understand it as, as being the result of some constraint. The, the fact that we can define a GPT at all is the result of some constraint, which, which uh, requires that we do have repeated instances of things. Um, and so the idea of, of, of relativizing to the set of GPT mosaics means that we take it for granted that we're in a mosaic where it does make sense to uh, say that we have, have identity, repeated instances. Instance repeated of instances are I mean, not supposed to be 
Oh, sorry to interrupt. Repeated instances of things no, are on. supposed to, they're supposed to not be like theoretical entities. They're supposed to be concrete. Yeah, so uh, when I, I talk about frequencies, I mean the actual actual frequencies in the actual Hermian mosaic and not not hypothetical frequencies. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Uh, the next hand I have is from Jeremy and then I have Guy after Jeremy. Jeremy, go ahead. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Emily, thanks so much for the talk. This is uh, really cool uh, and I really like thinking about GPTs this way. Um, so so I, I basically wanted to run by you um, a thought to see if you'd be open to what I think might be a strengthening of your of your argument or, or an argument for a stronger claim. So, so I took you to be making uh, the maybe somewhat mild claim that, look, most, most people who use GPTs uh, think about these things operationally. Um, but if you're going into it with, uh, with a realist attitude, you, you can feel free to adopt this philosophy. You can talk, uh, you can talk about it as talking about the... Uh, uh, the actual modal, modal structure of the actual world. Um, but but I, it strikes me that that maybe there are some things that physicists who are building GPTs say that um, uh, their talk is actually kind of hamstrung by the operational attitude. And, and what I have in mind is, is this mantra, what is kind of a mantra, right? Of like the difference that makes a difference between classical probability theory and quantum probability theory is the continuity of the dynamics, right? Having continuous and reversible dynamics, you know? And yeah, like um, if you take operational talk super seriously um, and you're thinking about the probabilities as encoding credences or information, if, if it's credences, um, it certainly, certainly seems strange that continuity would be the difference that makes a difference, right? Um, which, which is maybe like, yeah. I, I don't think I've seen Cubist uh, necessarily running to endorse this mantra and this might be a reason why, for example. Um, and if you're talking about information, right, um, yeah, maybe that gets you closer, but if you follow something like Chris Timpson's line, that it's a category mistake to say that information is in the world, you know, information is also the subjective notion, that doesn't seem to help you very much, right? But if you're adopting this uh, view that you're proposing, right, that it's talking about the modal structure, this seems like a much more natural way to give this uh, mantra some like real metaphysical meaning. Um, and so, and so I, would, I would almost want to say like, uh, this, this is uh, uh, an, an advantage, like, like it's, not, it's not just that this philosophy is here if you need it, if you're a realist, but, but this is in some sense more perspicuous for the way that some physicists are at least are already talking about these GPTs. Yeah, yeah, broadly speaking, I, I agree with you. I, I personally find a realist approach much more compelling and I think it, it makes a lot more sense of the way in which the framework is used. Um, the way I, reason I expressed my argument the way I did is basically just that I, I found it's more or less impossible to like argue an anti-realist deposition as kind of an article of faith so you know I think if you are determined to be an anti-realist there's probably nothing nothing I can do to change your mind um but but definitely yeah for me being a realist makes makes the whole thing much make much more sense and, and kind of makes sense of what, what the point of it all is and why we should why we should think that certain constraints explain rather than merely kind of formalizing Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Guy, go ahead. Thanks. That was very interesting, and I think you share a lot of your motivation. Uh, I want to ask about the uh, underdetermination. I, was not, I don't think I fully understand what you're saying about it. So the question is, what, what is, is it that we should really be structural, realist about? Because yeah. people, for example, people can derive the Cyrilson's bound from very different uh, axioms for yeah, yeah, exactly. information causality for on the one hand or the way uh, subsystems compose into big, big systems and classical limit so if we, we have these and they look very different um, then does this um, structural realism help us in the, with this problem of underdetermination? Yeah, so my claim is that in cases like deriving the Sir Elson bound, there is ultimately some objectively correct reason as to why the Sir Elson bound is the way it is, uh, which means that not all of those derivations can be correct. Um, but that said, they may all, all they may all be revealing some sort of some aspect or some some relevant point, uh, which might point us. They might they might all converge in the end on some underlying fundamental reason. I think that's the most likely thing. Um, but yeah, the, the concern is that if you are, if you want to be realist about 
the structures in a way that says that some structures are, cor are, are correct and others are not correct, um, which I think minimally you want to say that trivial axiomatizations like the A, AQ and BQ in one is not correct. Um, then you do obviously have under determination of structure and your options are either to kind of take the selective realist option and say that in some sense all of these structures are the same and not really meaningfully different uh, but my preference is for the option which says actually there is a correct answer um, and we're looking for it and we might not know even know what it is but it's the most scientifically useful thing to do is to take all the options seriously and regard them as meaningfully different And it's very interesting. I think it's going to be a, it, it sounds like a difficult project. <laughs> yes, yes, likely. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. So I have a question. Um, I was wondering, Emily, if you could elaborate a little bit on the role played by observers in GPTs, and in particular, uh, in, in your take on, on the connection between G GPTs and structural realism. Yeah, so as I said, I kind of put the measurement problem aside because I wanted to meet the meet this approach on its own terms um i do think that that the measurement problem remains something that needs to be uh, be solved for any any proponent of this sort of sort of approach um and i think ultimately what what you would probably like would be a way to single out a category of measurements which is independent of which is defined in purely physical terms and doesn't require um sort of wishy-washy comments about consciousness or or human observers or anything like that. Um, so that that I think remains an outstanding problem for, for this approach. And that's one of the reasons why I think al although accidentizations are very interesting and do reveal important insights, I think we do also need interpretations. Yeah, and I guess, you know, part of my inspiration for asking this question is you, you talk about principle theories. Uh, and if you think of special relativity, for example, as a principle theory, it also has a role played by observers. But in special relativity, observers cash out in terms of concrete, well-defined things like inertial reference frames yeah, that, exactly. that, that, are, yeah. that are not as murky, whereas the role played by the observer in GPTs is very difficult to pin down or say exactly what it is that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And so I think um, part of the way forward for, for this approach must involve understanding what exactly counts as the measurement uh, and I think that will probably have to be have to be done via some sort of synthesis with the various interpretational approaches and not it, as I said it's possible that one could do that by a kind of functional definition of measurement via accentization but that seems very difficult <laughs> great thanks so um I think we'll take a, a break now I want to thank Emily again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, and again, for those of you who may have joined late, the talks will be will be posted to the website. There were a couple of brief technical uh, lapses in Emily's talk, but I'll I'll piece it all together so it should all be fine. Um, Sorry. No problem. No problem at all. Uh, and um, so we'll take a brief break right now, uh, and we'll reconvene uh, on the hour. That's on my clock, three o'clock. Um, for an hour of discussion. So uh, please take a break and I'll, I'll see you in a few minutes.